Good okay. Evening, you, hi. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Nick Gunn. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about um, the SSH libraries in Elixir, which arrive basically courtesy of the sort of Erlang distribution. Um, who's a regu regular user of SSH here? Okay. Uh, who doesn't know what SSH is? Okay. Uh, so you will, um, not just after this talk, but that's, uh, so uh, SSH is, um, most people know it as a command line tool to, oh, yeah, to remote into uh, boxes securely, effectively uses um, public key uh, authentication to uh, encrypt an otherwise unsecure channel. Uh, it's typically used most people use it in an interactive fashion. They type SSH, then some host name. They get a shell on that remote system, typically used for sort of admin tasks and what have you. Um, it's, uh, it's got a number of the protocol itself has been around um, for nearly 30 years now um, uh, and has developed. Uh, like I say, most people familiar with it use it interactively for uh, shells. It can be used for one-off commands onto a remote host and to harvest the results back. Uh, also, like secure file transfer, fetching and receiving files from a remote host, and uh, tunnels, which are pretty cool, although they can be confusing. Um, we'll we'll come on to that. Um, the tunnels allow you to do cool things like get around ridiculous firewall restrictions that your administrators have put in place. Um, whilst leaving SSH wide open. Uh, so I've talked about uh, this. So uh, like I say, SSH is largely a sort of like a, at the bottom level, it will give you authentic, uh, will give you a sort of assurance that you're talking to the server you think you're talking to. You haven't been man in the middles. Um, and then it builds its protocols on top of that to do user authentication, uh, prevents users who are not permissioned from connecting to hosts and uh, doing things they shouldn't be doing. Uh, there's a number of diff uh, different authentication schemes. Um, most people, uh, my experience is mostly that people use public key. Uh, so they push their key to the remote host and say, that's my public key. Uh, and that allows them to uh, SSH as um, some remote user into that box. Um, password, uh, less so. I think it's because it's a little bit uh, clunky. Um, SSH certificates is a new thing where the, um, there is actually a similar chain of trust as there is with TLS uh, when you're doing HTTPS. Um, however, I'm not going to, I'm certainly, I'm, I won't be talking about password because it's, uh, it's less interesting, it's less amenable to, uh, to automation, uh, which is where I think some of the Erlang libraries are quite useful. And they don't yet support SSH certificates. Um, so, uh, as a tiny little bit of technical background, if you've SSH'd around hosts and so on, you're normally connecting to a daemon that is installed on the remote Linux box or the remote BSD doc, BSD doc. Um, and in this, if you SSH into an Elixir or Erlang virtual machine, uh, you're actually going into that process rather than into the SSH daemon. Uh, it just talks the same protocol. The client is unaware of uh, the fact that it's talking to uh, a Beam virtual machine. Uh, so SSH and Elixir uh, is all inherited from the Erlang libraries. There is an application uh, called SSH, which is made up of a multitude of modules, uh, about eight or nine of which are actually public modules with the public uh, supported API. Uh, we'll, and I'm gonna show you a few brief examples of using that. Um, and it in turn uh, builds on the crypto and public key applications that are also shipped with Erlang. Uh, and you'll find it in, uh, I mean, you can build it, you can build a distribution without it, um, but uh, most distributions ship with the SSH application. The libraries that they provide give you the facilities to write both SSH clients to talk to a remote daemon. That might be the standard SSHD daemon you'd find installed on some remote server, or uh, even you know to talk to uh, an Elixir SSH daemon, and that's something I'll touch on towards the end of the, this talk. 
Okay, let's get into it. Um, there's going to be low demo and mostly slides. Um, first thing you do when you uh, want to um, transport some information over SSH is you need to connect to the remote daemon. Um, now, when we're in typically in automation land, if we're in a sort of Elixir land, we don't want all the interactive crap that comes on the shell. We don't want it saying, hey, this is the fingerprint. Do you want to uh, accept it? Do you want me to write into your host file? So we turn all that off. Um, the one thing I'll talk about is obviously just silently accepting hosts without checking their fingerprint. Um, you know, obviously, as far as I know, everybody actually just does this when they do it interactively. They go, yeah, sure, and I know who that is. Um, and in this example, I've said, yeah, that's fine. I'll silently accept the hosts. Um, but uh, the library itself provides the facilities to get a callback and it will give you the fingerprint of the remote key and you could actually check that you're connecting to the host you think you're connecting to. So that call at the bottom, it means that you end up uh, with uh, uh, a TCP connection a secured. By the time you get that back, you, um, you have a secure TCP connection to the remote daemon. You can't do much with that by itself, but you need to do it first. So you need to issue that SSH connect call. And in this case, we're going to example.com. 22 is the standard SSH port. Um, we might change that later. Then we'll do a bunch of crap with that reference, useful work, and we'll amaze everybody, and then we'll close the reference. OK, uh, like a number of libraries in the Erlang framework, particularly those around sort of authentication, there are a gazillion options around which algorithms you actually want to allow the server and the client to negotiate over what type of um, authentication you want to do, what type of authentication you want to prohibit. Um, what I normally do in code is put the really common ones in configuration and put the contentious ones that are or ones I want to call out uh, into, uh, into code. And effectively, the SSH application will merge those uh, requirements. So I put a bunch of boring ones in, uh, into config, and I've put uh, contentious ones into, into my code so they can be reviewed. OK, you can't do any Once you've got a connection, uh, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, SSH itself is a multiplex protocol, uh, which means it can carry multiple channels over the same TCP connection. And everything in SSH happens essentially over a channel. Um, so uh, typically, uh, you'll uh, use the SSH module to get a connection, which we've shown before. And then you use session channel here to get an actual channel. And you can think of that because like, it's just an ID. It, in fact, is just an ID. It's just a number. And it's a unique number. It'll increment uh, each time you call session channel. Um, and you need that channel to do anything useful. Uh, and then at the bottom where I close that channel, I'm only closing the channel. The actual physical TCP connection represented by ref is still active. OK, now I actually want to do something useful. I have a secure connection to a remote host. I want to do something really important, like echo hello to the command line. Uh, so we use the exec function here. I pass the connection in the channel. Um, it's all Erlang, so they're still using like char lists, which is why I wrap them in the dash tilde C sigil. Um, uh, and essentially what that does is it says to the remote host, I want you to run this command on the remote host, capture the output, and send it back to me. Uh, this kind of garbage at the bottom is me just capturing all the results that come back um, until I get this closed message. Uh, and then I uh, finish the, the stream. OK, so what messages do we actually get when we invoke a remote process this way? Well, we'll get a data message. We may get many of these. It entirely depends on how the data actually gets shuffled down. Uh, we'll get an end of uh, file message, which effectively says um, this channel has, uh, uh, this stream has finished from this process. And then we get something that tells us what did the process we launched actually finish with. OK. Uh, there's a couple of other little pieces of information in there. Um, you can see the one. That's actually, that's just the call. That's the message just telling us which channel we're coming back on. We can have multiple channels in 
flight at one time and we may get, if we issue multiple commands, we'll get multiple messages back at different rates. Uh, and then in the data channel, you get told whether or not, did this data get pushed out to standard out or did it get pushed out to standard error? Uh, okay, SFTP, who said of FTP? Okay, file transfer protocol, it transfers files. Um, secure file transfer protocol does that, but securely. And it does it over uh, a channel, uh, not surprisingly enough. So uh, in this case, you call start channel in the, on the SSH SFTP module. Uh, and then uh, effectively, if you've ever actually used SFTP, a lot of people just use SCP. Um, I'll maybe talk very briefly about the difference between the two. Um, uh, SFTP is itself kind of an interactive protocol. You get an F SFTP session, you can hit LS, you can hit get, you can write get, put, you can push files, you can enumerate directories remotely on the host. Uh, the functions in the SFTP module allow you to do exactly that. Um, there's some quite sophisticated things in there, like you can say, I want to write exactly this blob to exactly this position in this remote file on the system. Um, some of those are there just to amortize the cost of of uh, making those um, uh, uh, calls. Um, but uh, essentially, that's what uh, you get with SFTP. So I'm just showing a very short flavor of that stuff. Um, I mentioned SCP. Most people I know actually use SCP to push files around. It's kind of simple. You just say SCP in wildcard. Um, SCP is not available in the SSH libraries for the reason that it is not part of the protocol. It's not part of the published protocol. SF SCP is just a hack that the OpenBSD people put in to open SSH. Uh, it sits on existing protocols. It's not very difficult to reverse what it does, um, but essentially it uses some of the other features of SSH to start a remote process that then listens to other commands. Um, it's arguably possibly more efficient. It's less but it, it's, it's in the margins. Um, SFTP is actually uh, documented. Okay, tunnels. Tunnels are the best thing. Tunnels are the things that give your administrators nightmares. Um, so tunnels allow you to push connections across uh, machines that would otherwise not be able to make them. There's a whole bunch of reasons why you might want to do this, not just annoying administrative um, restrictions. Um, in my own work doing um, testing on mobile devices, uh, I often want my device, the device I'm testing to be able to reach a web server uh, that might be tricky given the way the device is set up in the rack. Um, if I can get an SSH tunnel into that, I can effectively um, open uh, mechanism for it to reach, uh, maybe even a web server, maybe even like a little plug server that's already running in my automation process. Um, so um, there's two, four, two types of um, uh, tunnels. There's a forward tunnel. And basically, when I, when I've, uh, the way to imagine it is um, there are a number of parties involved in a tunnel. Uh, as the instigator of the tunnel, as the person who's process is running this code. When I say I want a forward tunnel, if we look at this example, uh, what I'm essentially saying in that forward tunnel is uh, I'm saying I want to listen on port 8443 on my local machine. In fact, because I'm doing this in Erlang, that's going to make the Beam virtual machine listen on that port in that process. Uh, and then I'm saying if anybody makes a connection to that port, I want to forward that connection to example.com, which is where I established the connection. And then I'm telling example.com to forward that connection itself onto foobar.com on port 443. Reverse tunnels uh, mess with your mind. Um, but effectively, what I'm doing is in the reverse tunnel, I'm telling example.com, I want you to listen on 8443. And if someone makes a connection to you, I want you to forward it to me across our SSH tunnel. And then I want you to forward that on to my local device, my local interface on 443. What could 
be less clear than that. Um, but they're pretty awesome. And often you find that, you know, if you're standing stuff up in test environments, you don't necessarily have all the connectivity that you'd actually want, or you're running things locally, maybe on dynamic ports. And the tunnels are an awesome way to sort of bypass some of the sort of uh, crap that you have to put up with to get a running environment. The fact that they're actually secure is often like not relevant to the fact that you just want to get a working pipe between two things. But, okay, well, that was all how clients talk to servers. That was how like you'd write Erlang code to ask a server to do something on your behalf. Um, but uh, arguably the cooler thing is like, how do you be an SSH server? Now, you don't actually see many of these in the wild in any particular language. Most people just rely on the fact that they can, um, they use SSH interactively and there is good old SSH D running on port 22 on the, on the remote box, which hopefully they can get into. Um, but Erlang actually makes it pretty easy to do some quite cool stuff. And uh, this is kind of in roughly in order of complexity. Uh, so the first thing you need to do, uh, I put this here because you kind of have to think about it a bit. So it's worth just having in the slides is if you're gonna be a daemon, you need a system directory that's going to host your host key. Now, normally a host has one host key and the SHD daemon has that, but you're not running the SHD daemon, you're running a some beam process. It still has to have some representation of being a host. It won't be the same host as if you went directly into the SHD daemon, but it's a key that represents the identity of the server. And then you need a user directory, and for the most part, all you need in there is, if you're familiar with the SSH stuff, is authorized keys. Authorized keys just contains the list of all the public keys of all the people who are permitted, or devices or whatever, who are permitted to connect to that service. If you're not in authorized keys in the user directory, you won't be able to reach the server. Okay, so what's the first cool thing we can do? Well, we could turn SSH off completely on the box and just open a daemon in the Erlang VM. Uh, we uh, have ignored other config. You don't need too much to actually get it bootstrapped. And here we just say, I want a daemon. I'm going to listen on port 2222, just to disambiguate myself. And there you just need to provide that shell parameter. Uh, and in that case, what happens when I just SSH, I'm just going into local host in the example, if I SSH into my local host now, I'm dropped immediately inside the process over a secure channel into the IX shell within my running virtual machine. I think that's pretty cool. I'm sure you can do it in other less terrible languages, but I think it's awesome. Okay, execution. This is also pretty neat. So uh, a kind of a bugbear, I, I mean, um, shells inside running production systems are awesome and maybe lots of people have read about how the guy uh, JPL you know fixed that um, um, satellite a bazillion miles away by doing something amazing over a Lisp REPL um, but they do kind of like give me the shits because someone could just come in and go system.holt uh, and I don't know I, I feel like uh, there's too much opportunity for misadventure but what if I could allow people to securely SSH in and I just had a restricted set of commands that they could run at all? Uh, and so in this case, I've configured a daemon with a function, uh, which I've just done anon anonymously uh, with this exec parameter. And then you can see that from the client, I can just issue a command. I tell it to beep. It's very important that it beeps. It takes a while for it to beep and then it completes the beep. Um, See, you could do a lot of things other than beeping, but beeping is also pretty good. Uh, SFTP, this is a bit similar to a web server in the sense that you can set up an entirely virtual file system. Um, in this case, uh, all I have done is I've said, if someone SFTPs into this Erlang virtual machine, uh, they can only, they, they consider root to be everything below user share man. Um, but the facilities are there to completely virtualize it. So it could be, whatever you're doing could be completely in memory. 
It wouldn't need to be on the physical file system at all. Uh, subsystems. Um, yeah, they're fine. Uh, they're kind of more of a convention. They're kind of like, uh, if you've ever used like bash aliases, kind of like bash aliases for SSH. Um, uh, they typically, uh, essentially what happens is on the client side, you say, hey, I want to run this subsystem. And the idea is that on the server side, uh, typically if you're using SSHD, you just say, I've got this subsystem and it actually runs this shell command. It's just a shorthand. Uh, in Elixir land, uh, uh, you actually implement a module uh, and it, when they pass that particular command, I've given it, I think I've called it my sub. Um, so what I've said here is on port 2022, if someone uses the dash s my sub, I want you to fire up my my sub module uh, and uh, invoke it. Now, what does invoke it mean? Uh, there is a behavior called SSH server channel. That is kind of the bottom of the stack for being a server. Like if you want to do the really low level be involved in the messages that actually flow back and forth from a client to a server. Um, you implement that um, SSH server channel behavior. It, we'll actually look at it in a second or even now. And it's not too dissimilar to uh, gen server. So you initialize, you handle some messages. Uh, the reason there's two handle messages there is the, the plain handle message normally delivers one normally one thing which is like hey a new ssh channel has been started uh, and, and thereafter you get a bunch of different ssh messages down the uh third callback uh, so it's pretty similar to like um a gen server the messages are a bit um they're kind of a bit weird if you're used to dealing with terminals or um pseudo terminals you get things like hey the user just resized their window terminal at the other side um what could possibly be interesting about that? But nevertheless, uh, they, they let you do that. Um, so if you're implementing server channels, you're really in the guts now. You're not just tweaking other behavior that's available in the, um, in the library uh, or adapting it. You're really sort of in the guts and um, uh, you, know, you have to respond to certain messages in certain ways. The documentation is pretty good about what you have to do. Um, oh. Demo. Right, let's see if I can even show this. One second. Uh, right. Uh, I'm going to start a pro. I don't know if the other guys can still hear me. They probably can't see anything at the moment, but I'll try and share, make sure my screen is shared properly. Um, so I've got a piece of code I'm not going to show you. Well, I can show you, but I won't because it'll be boring, um, which runs a subsystem. Uh, and okay. obviously it's server, so it doesn't actually have put anything useful when you run it. Um, no, no, you don't need to see this. Um, what I do want to do, ah, oh, yes. Ah, oh, cool retro term. Right. Uh, I'm going to run this once, and then I'll run it again for the people on the internet once I've figured out how to share that part of the screen. Um, so I'm going to connect to... Uh, so all that's happening, I'm using the standard SSH client now. Um, the implementation of the authentication is going to happen inside the Beam, not, on, not inside SSHD. And then it's going to hand over to my subsystem. And so who knows what it does? Ooh. <laughs> uh, uh, no, um, I don't know. Three seems topical. <laughs> A life lesson and a technical presentation. Um, yeah, so 
Uh, that is actually a surprisingly small amount of code to even mimic the whole crappy teletype thing. Uh, the kind of neat thing, uh, and I apologize for the internet people, I will get it running in a second. Um, the kind of neat thing is that one part of the message is because it's primarily a terminal interactive protocol, is SH will tell you as a server, it'll say, hey, your client is a VT100 or an Xterm256. And then uh, in my code, what I do is I just shell out to, in Elixir, I just shell out to Infocomp. I don't know if you're familiar. Infocomp will give me all the information about that terminal. It'll say, hey, if you want to clear the screen, you need to send this crazy escape code. Or if you need to move the cursor here, you need to send this crazy escape code. Um, so it's actually not very difficult to write something that's sort of terminal independent, but it looks kind of cool in the kind of retro, I was actually born in the 70s kind of way, and it feels like homely and warm. Um, and I don't like web stuff. So um, yeah, that's basically um, SSH. Uh, uh, let me see if I can actually just um, change my, uh, find out what on earth I'm doing. And where's my Zoom window gone? Uh, okay. So I want to share a different window now. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing a second and try and share a different screen. Uh, is it that one? No. Have I still got it? Uh, okay. Why don't I just share my entire screen? Okay. I'm going to try again. Kind of giving it away. I don't, I'm assuming internet people can see this. No, we've got your web browser. This, I'm sorry, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, so internet people, you get to vote quickly as well. Good idea. They can't see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, we get to see it twice to make up for it. I apologize. Uh, yeah, so... Um, uh, I think like, I, I personally really like the sort of server side stuff. Uh, I really like the idea of having simple administrative terminals, just SSH in, use public key authentication, get in, secure channel, you know, do some admin. Um, I'm probably a bit old school, um, but I uh, professionally, definitely the client stuff I find very useful in sort of complicated distributed testing environments being able to sort of leverage SSH without sort of firing up a separate process, but doing it all inside the VM, especially when you consider the Beam gives you the opportunity to run all sorts of things fairly safely inside one virtual one OS process. So I can have like a web server running in there. I can have all sorts of servers running. I can hook them up to remote devices through SSH. So yeah, it's, um, it's pretty handy. I'll narrow this to the online people. <laughs> No. No. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, I don't know why it didn't. Uh, why it didn't share? Oh, is it? Is it there? Oh yeah, it is. Uh, let me try again. Um, uh, oh, I'm gonna stop sharing. See if I can, who, okay, is it uh, this one? It is. I'm going to try again, guys. I do apologize for the delay. Uh, Got it. So we've just SSH into a subsystem. This is all Elixir code. What's more, there's no um, myth crap going on or anything. This is just sending um, bytes down a socket. So uh, you don't have any of the sort of gotchas. Uh, uh, you know, I can do input output um so yeah it is amazing has um anyone got any other questions like a, like practical questions not kind of stuff i goofed it off on can you hear us online uh it's not a huge amount um subsystem itself uh let me have a look if I've, i'm even
Uh, so this is that's that's the entire subsystem. Uh, it's not everything. It's mostly the messages, and then there's some terminal handling. Um, but uh, here's the sort of. Oh, I'm going to make this bigger so you've got a chance. Um, can everybody see that? Uh, actually, internet people won't be able to see it. One second. Um, Uh, so, uh, let me go. Uh, most the behavior callbacks, uh, sort of mostly there's that in it. We don't do much, um, handle message. The one we care about is a channel up message that tells us we've got a channel we're going. It gives us the uh, channel for it. Um, and then handle SSH message. So I guess this is where the magic is. Uh, to a degree, it's not the printing, but you can see the data message comes in here uh, near the top. Um, and then I match on like, you know, the user can only press three. I'm determined to play global firm only clear or uh, otherwise it just gets tossed away. Um, here are some of the sort of esoteric messages. So here's the PTY message. It tells me that I like a pseudo terminal has been allocated by the client, gives me some information about its width and its height. Uh, I'll also get like window change events if people drag that one way or another. Uh, you get and and so you get to know something about the environment that the caller was in. You get past end messages, um, and then effectively shell comes in. It says, "Hey, the user wants a shell." So because a subsystem can do anything, SFTP is a subsystem. Um, uh, shell is the message that tells you the user has started an interactive shell. Now, in this case, I just take it over. I don't wait for them to like type any crap in. I just take it over uh, and I start sending messages down to them. Uh, I just wrote a little crappy little thing. Um, so um, I send a clear, so clear message, I uh, do some stuff you don't want to look at where I look at the terminal codes, numbers of pauses, and then it's just the text. Um, and I have effectively uh, send the first lot, wait for the input, send the second lot. Um, so, like, I don't know what it is. Like, that in itself is, you know, and that includes some crap. Is like 120 lines of code. Uh, there is some stuff in um, the terminal, uh, which you also don't want to look at. But actually, that's only what 70 lines of code. And that looks up the info comp database and says, um, "You better. They've just connected with the next term, 256 color thing. You better tell me how I drive it." So I just uh, use a port to grab that information. Uh, that's a great question. So there was a question about what the default cipher keys uh, are. Uh, you'd have to look at you'd have to look at the doco. Um, they they do change like the just like the TLS stuff, the Erlang team deprecate uh, certain negotiations um over time and you you have uh, i don't know what the default ones are off the top of my head you have um um you know i use a, like an elliptic curve key so you know it's all supported uh i think it uses i think by default the once this uh once you've done the public key it's um it's aes in ctr mode uh is the actual symmetric cipher i, I think because it's the most efficient way to do AES. You can do it in parallel. Um, so what are you doing on window change? So remember you're saying that they can do that and you don't know why. So what are you doing? Uh, I'm just recording. Like if you look on the, yeah, if you see, I think it's invisible now, the on window change. I'm just recording the new width and height yeah. in my end state, but I don't do anything with it. But I might. If I'm, I'm, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm going to keep that width and height in line, no matter what you throw at me. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, typically that's where you might repaint the screen. You might relay out things if things are set out proportionally and so on. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Can I suggest something special for people who need programming? Please don't do this at home. Especially if you are explain to Nick that you know the search function end-to-end, please, yes. Otherwise, there's a lot of things security-wise. I think we can go around. So, yeah, that's why I asked about the top Because the email itself went through quite a history of hardening because 
those reports once, but not necessarily still. Um, yeah, just know if you go, just know what's going on. Sage advice. Don't do anything with crypto ever. <laughs> uh, that's that's proper crypto, not kids' crypto. Okay, thanks very much.